This meeting is being recorded.
Good afternoon and welcome to Hukum Online International Webinar Encouraging Asian Community to Promote Peace in Myanmar on Thursday, 17 June 2021 on Zoom platform. This webinar is a collaboration between ASEAN Burma, the One-on-One -on -one World, the Progressive Voice, and also supported by Asian Law Student Association, Universitas 11 Maret, Universitas Jember, Universitas Prasetya Mulia, Universitas Mataram, Universitas Nasional, Universitas Yarsi, Universitas Esa Unggul, Universitas Parayangan, Universitas Brawijaya, dan Universitas Islam Indonesia. First of all, we would like to welcome Director General of Asia Pacific and African Affairs, Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Indonesia, Mr. Abdul Qadir Jailani. Good afternoon, Mr. Abdul Qadir. Good afternoon, everybody. Continuing with Mr. Amri Hakim, as Chief Content Officer of HukumOnline.com. Good afternoon, Mr. Amri. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Halda. And we also would like to welcome our speakers for today's event. Mr. Marzuki Darusman, as former chairman, UN International Independent Fact-Finding Mission for Myanmar. Welcome, Mr. Marzuki. Good afternoon. Thank you. And Ms. Debbie Storthart, as coordinator of the Alternative Asian Network on Burma. Good, good afternoon, Ms. Debbie. Hello. Good afternoon. Thanks for having me. Sure. Continuing with Ms. Kin Omar, as founder and chairperson of the advisory board of the Progressive Voice. Welcome, Ms. Omar. Thank you. And the last Hello. one. Thank you. And the last one is Mr. Wong Poon Amarintewa as editorial staff of the One on One World. Welcome, Mr. Wong Poon. And good afternoon. And I also would like to welcome our moderator for our discussion today, Ms. Farah Purwaningrup as partnership and community manager of HukumOnline.com. Good afternoon, Ms. Farah. Good afternoon. Hi, everyone. Thank you. And good afternoon to all the guests and participants for today's event. Thank you very much for coming. My name is Kalda, and I would be your MC for today. First of all, before we starting our discussion for today, I also would like to remind to all the participants that there is an interpretation feature below, uh, which is next to the leave button. Uh, so uh, please use the interpretation feature uh, to hear the private language. Thank you. And before moving on to the next agenda, we will hear the opening uh, speech from uh, our keynote speech, Mr. Abdul Qadir Jailani uh, as the General of, Director General of Asia Pacific and African Affairs of Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Indonesia. For Mr. Abdul Qadir Jailani, the time is yours. Distinguished speakers and participants, Ladies and gentlemen, to begin with, I should express my appreciation to Hukum Online, particularly to Pa Amri Hakim. Thank you for organizing this timely webinar on encouraging ASEAN community to promote peace in Myanmar. Today, I will speak on behalf of the Minister for Foreign Affairs who due to her previous engagement could not join with you all. I believe that today's discussion is very important one and I hope by intensively discussing what we can all contribute towards finding recommendation on how to best approach the Myanmar crisis. Ladies and gentlemen, the situation in Myanmar took an unexpected turn since the military took power in February early this year. ASEAN has done a lot of things to help Myanmar to find acceptable solution to the crisis. However, the situation looks bleak. The number of victims is worrisomely predicted to continue to rise. If the situation is not immediately resolved, it seems that this crisis will not be offered anytime soon. Only 
and only if all of involved parties begin, the dialogue could we see light at the end of the tunnel. Distinguished speakers and participants, ASEAN needs to consider taking the following steps in its effort to help resolving the Myanmar crisis. The first step is ASEAN must reconsolidate its commitment to urge the Tatmado to implement the ASEAN consensus on Myanmar. In this regard, ASEAN must be able to act collectively with a stronger sense of unity in order to ensure the success of its endeavor. At the moment, it seems that the five-point consensus is the only feasible option on the table. Hence, it is imperative that the five-point consensus be immediately implemented for the, for, for the sake of well-being of the people of Myanmar and the greater peace in the region. Second, ASEAN must expedite the appointment and dispatch the ASEAN Special Envoy. Further delaying the process will only undermine the grouping's credibility. The Special Envoy should be equipped with clear policy guidance in accordance with the mandate of the five point consensus. Myanmar must respect its commitment and grant access to the special envoy to visit the country and of course to meet all the parties concerned, including the political detainees. Third, all ASEAN countries as a one family should use their respective sphere of influence to secure international support for ASEAN efforts in bringing about a peaceful solution in Myanmar. All process of the implementation of the, of the five point consensus should be conducted in transparent manner to maintain ASEAN unity. ASEAN needs stronger commitment to expedite the consensus implementation. Once again, the delay on such implementation could only mean delay in finding amicable solution. So much is at stake. Distinguished speakers, participants, ladies and gentlemen, finally, I'm confident that much discourse will take place throughout this webinar. Such rich sharing of perspective will shed light on efforts towards proposing policy recommendation on how to best engage Myanmar. Before I conclude my remarks, let me once again wish you all a good and fruitful discussion. I thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Thank you very much, Mr. Abdul Qadir, for the keynote speech for today. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, before moving on to the next agenda, we will hear the opening speech from Mr. Amri Hakim as Chief Content Officer of HukumOnline.com. Mr. Amri Hakim, the time is yours. Thank you, Halden. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Our honorable partners, Out ASEAN Burma, the One One World, and the Progressive Voice. Our keynote speaker, the Honorable Mr. Abdul Qadir Jailani, as Director General of Asia Pacific and African Affairs, Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Indonesia. Our distinguished speakers, Mr. Kim Ohmar, as Founder and Chairperson of the Advisory Board of Progressive Voice. 
Mr. Marzuki Darusman, former chairman, UN International Independent Fact Finding Mission for Myanmar. Ms. Debbie Stothart, coordinator of the Alternative ASEAN Network on Burma. Mr. Wong Pun Amarin Tiwa, editorial staff of the 101 World. Also, my colleague, Ms. Farah Purwa Mengnu, partnership and community manager Hukum Online as our moderator for today and all our esteemed participants. Thank you all for participating in this webinar entitled Encouraging ASEAN Community to Promote Peace in Myanmar. On behalf of Ukum Online, we are pleased and honored to have you with us. And I would like to sincerely express my gratitude to all the speakers who are willing to spend their time on this webinar. I am delighted uh, you join us today and welcome you to Hukum Online International Webinar. Ladies and gentlemen, this webinar is, con is, the, is a continuity after one that was successfully held on 9 April 2021. The webinar is our commitment regarding issues that are thriving now. The support of the international community, especially ASEAN, becomes an important role in relations to resolving conflicts in Myanmar. With a larger scale that we have as of now, supported by universities and international organizations from the speakers, it will bring enriched international and multidimensional perspective to understand the current situation in Myanmar. The previous webinar on Myanmar in April discussed political and social situation in Myanmar, legal including international law aspects of what is unfolding in Myanmar, measures and steps taken at ASEAN level as well as positions and role of Indonesia as regards Myanmar's current situations. We had enriched perspective from Mr. Swewin, Editor-in-Chief of Myanmar Now, Mr. Usman Hamid, Executive Director of Amnesty International Indonesia, Mr. Abdul Qadir Jalani, Asia Pacific General Director of Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and also Ms. Christina Ariani, Member of House of Representatives. And what followed? Thereafter was a stimulating discussions with participants in the webinar. Ladies and gentlemen, finally, as the largest legal community in Indonesia that support independent journalism for more than two decades, we hope that Hukum Online could be a platform that educates and enlightens people regarding this issue, including legal issues that is unraveling in Myanmar. I would like to thank all the organizations and our universities who support today's forum. I hope this webinar will generate new perspective and of course bring benefits to all of us. Thank you very much. Good afternoon and I wish you a fruitful discussions. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much, Mr. Amri, for the speech. So, uh, we are going to start our discussion for today. We will listen to our speakers' presentations about the current issues in Myanmar and how could Asian communities help that. This discussion will be led by our moderator, Ms. Farah. For Ms. Farah, you can start the discussion now. Thank you very much, Valda. Um, and I would like to, in particular, thank um, esteemed keynote speakers who have uh, shared their insights. Uh, thank you, Pak Abdul Qadir Jailani, and also um, uh, uh, Amri ha Hakim. And in today's webinar, we will focus on encouraging Asian community to promote peace in Myanmar. Um, we um, have heard as regards our latest development that the UN Security Council will have a closed session on 18 June um, 2021 to discuss ASEAN solution in managing the crisis in Myanmar as uh, in terms of diplomacy and effect effectiveness um, of ASEAN. ASEAN itself has not performed very well in seeking feasible solution in Myanmar. ASEAN has led, however, diplomatic effort in resolving conflict and crisis in Myanmar. Um, notably, it is powerless in um, pressuring the military junta or the Padmado in this case um, in Myanmar. Um, um, we've heard of, of the, of, um, I think there's an ASEAN consensus meeting whereby there are five points that, um, that, that's been agreed. One of them is that violence in Myanmar must cease immediately and every party is exercising self-restraint 
and constructing a dialogue between all parties concerned there of is a necessity and um, subsequent thereafter, there should be peace created for the benefit of people. And the third consensus pointed out, as uh, Abdul Qadir has pointed out, a special envoy for, uh, of the chair of ASEAN who will facilitate mediation and dialogue um, with the ASEAN general, um, secretary general assistance. Now, um, let's uh, look at um, this in perspective. We have right now um, speakers who um, are with us, resource person. Um, we have... Um, uh, Ms. Kim Omar, who is founder uh, and chairperson of the Advisory Progressive Voice. Uh, Kim Omar, if you would allow me, I'll just uh, read a quick through of their uh, biography. Uh, Kim Omar is a Burmese democracy and human rights activist since 1988, when she joined the student movement to organize a nationwide pro-democracy uprising. She was forced into exile after the military brutally cracked down um, the peaceful protest. Um, uh, Ms. Omar is the founder and chairperson of the Advisory Board of Progressive Voice, a Myanmar human rights research um, and advocacy organization. She also has won several awards. Uh, it's lovely having you with us, um, Ms. Omar. She won, for example, in 2008, uh, Anna Lynn Price awarded annually to a woman or young person with the courage to fight indifference, prejudice, oppression, and injustice in order to promote a good life for all people in an environment marked by respect for human rights. So here we have Ms. Umar. We also have Bapak Marzuki Darisman. Ms. Marzuki Darisman, my apologies. Pak Darisman is a, he's a former chairman, UN International Independent Fact Finding Mission for Myanmar. He's um, uh, also a special rapporteur on the situation of human rights in the Democratic Republic of Korea. Korea. He has a long standing experience when it comes to human rights. And he's a former attorney, attorney general of Indonesia. Um, it's very nice to have you with us, Pak Marzuki Darusman. And you. also, <laughs> uh, we have as well, uh, Wong Pun, um, um, uh, Wong Pun Amari, I'm sorry, uh, Wong Pun Amarin Tewa. He's editorial staff of the 101 World. He's an international news reporter with uh, also a long standing experience uh, when it comes to social media platforms and reporting with particular experience, work experience also covering East Asia or Japan. Uh, uh, very nice to have you with us, uh, Wong Poon. And uh, we have uh, Debbie Stonehart, Miss Debbie, who is with us today. Uh, Debbie is um, a Malaysian. She has worked with diverse community activists to engage states, I, um, international government organizations, and other stakeholders on human rights and justice. She's the coordinator of the Alternative, Alternative Asian Network um, on Burma. And she founded the Alternative Asian Network on Burma in 1996. Um, it's uh, very nice um, uh, to have you with us, Debbie. I think we'll kickstart the discussion. Um, um, yes, thank you, Pak Abdul Kadir Jailani. Terima kasih. <laughs> we'll kickstart the discussion, like what's said in the beginning. Um, we'll have an enriched, uh, perspect uh, enriched perspective and uh, multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary um um, discussion on this uh, encouraging Asian community to promote peace from ASEAN itself. We'll start with Ms. Kun, uh, Kim Umar. Ms. Umar, the screen is yours um, for your talk. We would like to know what's happening in Myanmar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. And thanks also my special appreciation to Hakum Online for organizing this uh, timely and very important event. And also for having me to update you all on the current situation in Myanmar and also our people's aspiration and hope after this uh, very un un eventful, um, horrific military coup. Pak Abdul Kader, uh, Pak Mazuki, distinguished speakers and guests, it has been as you all already seen and following, it's been a very uh, hard, hard, disheartening, heartbreaking and horrific four months that we have watched uh, what's happening to the people of Myanmar. Since the military's attempted coup on February 1st, we see that this coup has led the people of Myanmar to turn a new page in their long history of resistance and defiance against the Myanmar military. While their aspiration for democracy is high and persistent, 
uh, to be, you know, the, with this desire, like persistent desire to be free from the military tyranny. We also see that I have noticed, also observed that the people are wounded very deeply now. After four and a half months passed, the situations become even much more dire, dire as um, Park Abdul Kader already exp uh, also expressed in his keynote speech, as the military hunter continues attacking the people and continue with its nationwide all-out war ter terror campaign against the people. As of yesterday, June 16th, the military has killed at least 865 people including 74 children, the youngest is four year old, in cold blood and arrested more than 6,000 people. Nearly 5,000 remain in detention and they are facing torture, murder, assaults, and also deprivation of food and water. Women and LGBTIQ persons in detention are also facing sexual violence. About 2,000 people are evading arrest warrants. What is really worrying for me to see is that this military hunters, armed forces, armed people are really enjoying at committing these atrocities that I have already um, shared with you. The killings are ex executional style, using heavy war weaponry, in desperate with the deliberate soul aim. Are you able to hear me well? I'm hearing I hear well. well. I'm hearing I'm hearing well. well. I'm hearing well. I'm hearing um, I think um, um, I should ask uh, speakers to mute um, their um, their voice. Um, so, Mr. Omar, Miss Omar can uh, deliver her speech. No worries. Thank you, you Miss Omar. <laughs> Okay, thank you. So what I'm seeing is that this uh, the, the 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 armed forces, the the, the security forces, uh, the military, you know, like uh, they are snatching the bodies that they killed and they mutilate them and they carry out illegal autopsies and also removing the evidence of the like bullets, but also removing the organs. So when the the the, the dead bodies were returned to their families. You like you know the 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 bodies are like uh, cut open and repatched, while the the organs inside are missing, and also they are contacting the cremation without their family members family's um, permission, and also something very disturbing happening is that they are extorting the money from their family members to return the the bodies of their loved ones, and now also the 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 the, the military hunter has revived the death penalty. They are actually using it and so far convicted about 50 people to death, death sentence that includes the children under 18. And they're destroying and also looting the private properties, including the food, cash, cell phones, motorcycles, and even the livestock. And the cases of abduction of their family members and holding them hostage and even sentencing, sentencing their family members to imprisonment is also now increasing. The abduction, among the abduction uh, 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 family members, uh, some are as young as two year old children, while also some are as old as 75 year old parents. So this is something like very, you know, like a, uh, it's something that you know we haven't seen even in the in the past uh, few decades of the previous military regime during the dark time, and and that makes us also to make uh, see very clearly that this military is nothing but a criminal gang. These atrocities happening in the cities and urbans that I I just shared with you for the last four months are not new to the ethnic communities. During the past seventy years. That's what's happening to the ethnic communities. But since the coup, we are seeing the intensification of the offensives launched by this military in ethnic areas, reaching extreme heights. They are waging the war on multiple fronts of the different ethnic communities. My colleague Debbie Stoddard from ASEAN Burma will share with you soon on the details of these uh, events unfolding. But what is important for us to note here is that the hunter launched these recent military offensives against the ethnic communities is because the ethnic revolutionary armies are taking the side with the people's movement 
and also protecting the uh, people who are fleeing from the military violence entering into their ethnic territories. And that's also the reason that these uh, offensives are coming to reaching to the extreme heights at this moment. Um, from this military coup, uh, I have learned many lessons and I think many of Myanmar people uh, have also learned like me, is that the transition in Myanmar had many, many weaknesses and challenges under the constraint of the military drafted constitution with the disproportionate political power secured through the constitution and therefore also the economic power. The military has created the facet democracy for the last nine years time. But being a long-term democracy and human rights activist myself, we knew things are not going to come, you know, like a tend to be smooth and, and, and moving forward. And, and, and I had in fact warned the international community not to be over enthusiastic and particularly not to trust this military. Um, but many were deceived by the military, coerced and also co-opted and trapped. See, but nevertheless, the, 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 even with a limited space and freedom under this military control civic space, our people learn and grow and continue to keep pushing for the, 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 the opening to become a, a genuinely democratic um, but the thing is, it is with that cautious optimism when the democratic forces kept stri striving hard and walking hard to have more freedom and more democratic space. And then that, of course, becomes a threat to this military who never had the plan to actually transfer the power to the people. So now the youth in particular who were working so hard for their better future and for better Myanmar, they have this military coup have taken their future suddenly taken away from them. And of course, they are not going to let it let go of their dreams easily. So this coup was a wake up call loud and clear that this military first never intended to give up their power, but also very clear that, you know, no democratic transition can actually be implemented at the gunpoint. So these are the lessons that we have learned, I have learned at least. Um, so now the Myanmar people are back in full fight for democracy. In, fight, in spite of the COVID crisis, now we are at the crossroads. The outright rejection of the military that people expressed in the election in November 2020 and now through the past four months of their, you know, like a persistent defiance against this military. But what is the, 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 the very positive thing coming out of this uh, four months is also that people are actually coming to be unified collectively and connecting each other and also strengthening the country's social fabric by sharing, caring and protecting one another. And this is something that I would like for the ASEAN leaders to realize that there is a hope for this country and that hope lies within the people. Uh, what we saw is that these millions of people march on the streets in the last, you know, the, the three months of the military coup. But now, yes, the, the, the demonstrations on the streets, peaceful protests are smaller in size and number, but continue to be across the country in different parts of the, 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 the country, every day happening. And this is something that we need to also realize this resilience on the ground, how strong they are. And the civil disobedience movement started immediately after the coup by doctors and factory workers expanded quickly to the other sectors. And now you can see that you know, like even the, uh, the, the, you know, like until now, this is so, uh, so strong that the military had actually still don't know how to handle with that, except keep using the force keep using the intimidation and threats and arrest and torture and all of that. And also we see that the, the civil, you know, like a journalist and citizen journalists are like, they are really contributing so much to let you all, let the world and let you all know what is happening to them. And, you know, like, a, so these are the, 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 the strength of the, the movement that I want to share with you in spite of this brute force and violence that they are facing from this military. Um, but you see, like, you know, in the last two months, Myanmar people were calling on the United Nations in particular to come and help them prevent from their violence and stop these atrocities. But no help come from the UN, no help come from the ASEAN either. 
And and at this point, I can only tell you that people really come to seem to be coming to realize that nobody is coming to help them and save them from this military's brutality. So what we are seeing now is also the people and particularly the youth are actually exercise exercising their birthright to defend themselves, even forming what they call as people defense forces. Of course, I'm very worried because I don't want to see this young generation losing their future. You know, these are the like, you know, students, you know, like uh, doctors and engineers and you know, like uh, technicians. And but now they are coming to be taken to the point of protecting themselves with whatever that they can. And 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 that worries me while I see how much of their determination is so inspirational. Um, but all of these combine from the people from different, you know, like a, a corner of the country. What we see is this military is unable to take full control of the country. And in fact, their military coup attempt is failing because they don't have the control over the administration. They don't have the control over the banks, hospitals, and even the schools. They don't have the control over it. And even the other day, they are actually threatening the whole village if the, the students don't show up at the school the whole village will be shot and killed. And that's how they are desperate on one hand while using those uh, violence against the people. Um, one thing that I also want to find out that is a looming humanitarian crisis in the country. But the people are helping out among themselves, communities and volunteers coming together and they are forming these charity initiatives to address this humanitarian crisis. And this is something that ASEAN leaders need to support these local initiatives and local leadership. And um, now um, I also want to uh, bring in your attention that this spring revolution, this, like I said, has brought the people to come together. And this meaning also that, you know, their whole purpose is to end this military tyranny once and for all. And this common objectives of they are purpose coming together. And this is something that they really need for you to help, for you to support. Um, and also like, you know, the, the whole purpose of this movement now is not to go back to the status quo, but to actually move forward to the point to address the longstanding root causes of the country's problems, including to come up with a constitution that will actually ensure the federal democracy that will actually provide the equality and you know, like a, the, the, the equality to all the people in Myanmar. And this is the roadmap, people's roadmap and aspiration that the ASEAN leaders must recognize and support. And in this regard, there is a positive political development taking place, which is the national unity government uh, form in, comp in comprise of elected representatives from the 2020 election, together with the rep representatives from the different ethnic communities, as well as the general strike committees of the spring revolution. And this is the, the truly uh, democratically elected and people representative government that we need the ASEAN to engage and support and recognize their legitimacy because it is the government that presents the unique opportunity also for our country to move forward. But it is disheartening for me to see that the recent trip by the ASEAN chair and the SecGen only uh, to Myanmar only meeting with this military hunter, but not meeting with the represent representative government of the people is not a way to go, not a way to go because ASEAN really needs to recognize uh, that today's violence and atrocities this military is committing are only possible because of a complete lack of accountability for their crimes in the past. That along with the international community, the ASEAN also have neglected and put aside and you know put it under the table. And this is a no way that is not to move forward anymore for our country. Um, so that is something that you know, like uh, the military continue to be, to me, they continue to be still like taken for granted that the ASEAN will still protect them, which I think this we need to counter together. We have a long way to go, of course, dear friends. Democracy is a process that we are also aware of it that we cannot be we cannot achieve in overnight. But when I think of how long that we have struggled for many generations, this is the time 
this must be a time that our people, you know, have sacrificed so much at the great cost, even to be able to enjoy the basic freedom rights, free basic freedoms and basic rights. And I think this is something that ASEAN must realize that Myanmar must move forward to another step that will actually uh, 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 guarantee the basic rights of the people that where we can, we can only when we can only uh, move forward to achieve a sustainable uh, peace and development. Um, so with that, I want to say that like, you know, for like in the last uh, point that I want to raise is that um, right now, the clear, you know, like uh, uh, the action from the, United, the, the, the ASEAN is not really there. Uh, and ASEAN continue to fail to recognize our people's desire. And I think this, from this on, we really need, need, need the ASEAN to be taking the steps. And Indonesia has the leadership in it that we see. The decision of the ASEAN leadership, ASEAN uh, delegation after this, I think this is a big lesson for ASEAN to learn, take a step back and see how they can take the next step, which I see that the ASEAN need to set a new precedent in this point. Um, I, my last point that I want to make is also when the ASEAN continues to fail to take final, uh, take the, the meaningful action, the, co the, sorry, the corporations and businesses from member states continuing their business as usual with the military hunter. And that also, we need to address that. We need to really address that. And there are companies such as like Vietel of Vietnam, PPT of Thailand, Petronas of Malaysia, and in uh, Intera Resources, the company of Indonesia, Oligarch, Edwin, uh, Sorajara, for example, to name a few. Their financial flows to the Honda must be cut. And we call on the ASEAN members to comply with their international obligation under the UN guiding principles on business and human rights and stop all these financial flows to the Honda. So, in closing, I want to say that the ASEAN risk being complicit in aiding and abetting this military to continue commit such international crimes if ASEAN endorse this military hunter. And this is, I am very worried that, you know, I hope that the Indonesia will take the leadership to ensure that ASEAN will not fall into that trap where the ASEAN will be uh, seen uh, complicit in these crimes. And I have posted, uh, like just my last point, I want to share that I have posted about this event on my social media and my Myanmar colleagues, Myanmar people, they com commented and they even asked me to tell you in this uh, forum that they have no, no more faith in the ASEAN, which is very sad, uh, but also they even want to leave ASEAN. They even want to leave ASEAN because they don't think the ASEAN can help them uh, save their lives anymore. So at this point, I propose the ASEAN to set the new president, uh, but that is to start with, to gain uh, trust from the Myanmar people. And how can we do that? So my proposal is for the ASEAN to start with the very concrete and practical actions, which is already before them right now, which is the call from the Myanmar people to support they are called at the United Nations General Assembly and Sec uh, Sec Sec Security Council to impose the arms embargo and also refer the Myanmar situation to the ICC to uh, hold the perpetrators to account. And, and then, you know, like take the unilateral actions to cut the financial flow to the hunter. So I hope that uh, we will see more leadership from Indonesia in the in the region, and I hope other countries, other members in the ASEAN, will also uh, take take the concrete actions. Because after all, if we don't address the Myanmar crisis in the right way, and then the whole region, there is no way to move forward. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Omar, uh, for your talk. Um, you. Um, You've highlighted three points. Um, first, um, um, I think, first of all, I learned a new, a new word from you. It's called cautious optimism when it comes to dealing with changes or um, military changes or social changes. And you've highlighted how um, three, two points, actually, um, how ASEAN's action is not really that. And how um, also you, you're calling that companies associated with the military junta are not madal to be cut in terms of you know its ties with um, with the military junta itself, 
and um, a rather bleak um, uh, note coming from 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 aspirations of uh, Burmese or people in Myanmar is that uh, they have no more faith in ASEAN, and therefore you call for more practical um, action-based um, uh, solution from ASEAN, and that is point on uh, Omar because. Um, we will have, uh, I think, uh, what's coming next is um, a talk, a presentation from uh, Bapak Marzuki Da Rusman. He's a human rights uh, advocate, also cha uh, former chairman of Independent International Fact Finding Commission, um, a Human Rights Council in Myanmar, whereby um, in his talk, he will discuss ASEAN countries um, to provide encouragement by way of um, diplomacy or by other ways that would be necessary and providing a spirit of restoration to Myanmar people, and also what steps and role that ought to or, that ought or should be taken uh, uh, by Indonesian government to resolve Myanmar's um, conflict, and what are the five points that make up the consensus as a result of the ASEAN high-level meeting. So I give the screen to you. Uh, the time is yours, uh, but, um, uh, Marzuki Darusman. You have 15 minutes to enlighten us on these points. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Farah, and thank you, Tukum Online, for this uh, opportunity to exchange views yeah, uh, on, on this matter. I would like to take my uh, cue from the Director General's uh, keynote and uh, Ms. Omar's uh, uh, presentation. To start with, uh, he did, perhaps not in passing, but <laughs> clearly say that the situation is bleak. That, that says a lot about how ASEAN is looking at the situation there. Furthermore, uh, Patadi was saying that uh, ASEAN may have to consolidate itself. Uh, which, of course, uh, speaks to the title of the webinar, Encouraging ASEAN to Promote Peace in Myanmar. It should be uh, how ASEAN should encourage uh, peace in uh, Myanmar. But it is finding itself uh, in a reverse situation. And uh, th this is a, a point that uh, I think we should... Uh, uh, look into, and that is that uh, we, we have a, a, an ideal uh, vision of ASEAN. Uh, the fact is that there is a real vision of ASEAN. Uh, to, to start a discussion, I think uh, when uh, Omar was saying that uh, the people may even uh, contemplate leaving ASEAN. I can understand. The behavior of ASEAN has been appalling, to say the least. And therefore, uh, it might not be the case that ASEAN is the sole solution to the uh, matter there. Although, of course, uh, we start from the premise that uh, in the final analysis, it is the people of Myanmar that will finally settle the, this whole matter inside the country. But uh, then again, uh, perhaps I think uh, Omar has uh, painted a very graphic picture. And uh, Debbie will probably uh, finish it off you know, uh, to, to really... Uh, drive home the enormity of what is happening there uh, until today. Uh, I'm told it, the, the, the deaths have, uh, in fact, uh, gone beyond 800. It's almost 1,000. And it keeps on uh, uh, tallying up. Now, uh, as Omar was saying that uh, perhaps we may have to step back and look at it uh, in terms of a larger uh, picture, yeah, and that is that uh, after four months, uh, the junta 
is not able to uh, establish its uh, primacy, it's uh, not able to subdue the uh, democracy movement. And uh, the, the movement is uh, very much alive, creative, and uh, at, for, at this point, uh, for now, I, I think uh, it's, it's, it's anybody's guess you know, that uh, it will be there for a while, and it has clear staying power. And therefore, uh, the junta will not be able to mobilize military or political power to defeat the movement. But having said that, I go back to what Pakadi was saying that the only way forward is dialogue. If the junta cannot mobilize military and political power to subdue the, the people, it might also have to be seen that the case is that the, the democracy movement uh, is finding itself in a, in a uh, situation that uh, will have to be uh, uh, protracted. A, a long term uh, uh, a struggle, a process uh, in the coming days. So, uh, if there's anything that is going to happen inside the country, and clearly uh, we have the trials of uh, Aung San Suu Kyi coming up. On, on charges of corruption, uh, you, you would think that that if uh, the pretext of taking over was uh, election fraud, that the trial, the, the ever first trial, would be electoral fraud related. No, it, it, it's, it's far from that. So uh, the trial itself belies the whole claim of the junta that it was electoral fraud that drove them to did what they did. And therefore, it is not a state of emergency. It is, uh, it is what it is, a takeover of power forcibly by the military. And therefore, uh, what we have here now is clearly a resistance movement from the uh, people. Now, it's interesting, of course, that uh, uh, what needs to be looked at uh, has allowed us to, uh, to gain a bit of a perspective of what, what uh, has taken place, uh, horrific violence uh, resulting in so many deaths and cruelty uh, imposed on the, on the population, uh, 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 so-called armed forces, imposing uh, on its own people the, the, the acts of brutality uh, that, that is beyond imagination. Now, moving forward, I think we are now faced with a two-dimensional, uh, uh, let us say, a process. One is the physical power politics uh, process, but also we are facing a narrative, a battle of narratives of what took place in Myanmar. And, uh, and therefore, uh, in terms of uh, the interest of time, uh, we will perhaps have to contemplate uh, that at some stage a dialogue will uh, take place. And therefore, to be practical about this, the international community, the regional community, the, the, the uh, um, individual members of ASEAN should consider engaging the national unity government to create a level playing field for a dialogue to take place eventually. 
And that is what could be done, uh, if not by ASEAN as a collectivity at the moment, it could be done by individual countries of ASEAN, member states of ASEAN, in conjunction with a few others. Uh, I take note that uh, Indonesia was mentioned uh, has, as uh, expecting to take the lead on this, rightly so, being the largest uh, country in the, in the region. I don't see how, why a two-track approach shouldn't be taken. One is the collective platform of ASEAN, which is now stalled at the moment because of the junta's intransigences. But at the same time, it is in the interest of individual member states of ASEAN to see to it that security is uh, ensured in this region and that therefore there is a compelling reason for individual countries to take lead in trying to do what ASEAN may not immediately able to do. And I'm looking perhaps also at Indonesia, but also at Thailand. So uh, that is the only way that perhaps could open up uh, the stalemate at the moment in ASEAN. One, uh, for uh, like-minded countries, member states to engage the NUG, which is, I think, happening uh, uh, on and off. Uh, but clearly, there is this interaction, there is this dynamic. And secondly, that individual member states should take the lead uh, in trying to uh, open up and crack open the, the, the uh, space uh, for a dialogue uh, to take place in, in Myanmar. Uh, and that means that... Uh, Recognizing the NUG, uh, acknowledging the, the existence of the NUG uh, is, is the way forward. Now, uh, finally, uh, I think I note that M. Omar was using the word transition. Uh, transition means from moving from one situation to the next situation. Meaning to say that uh, resistance may have to then shift over to a, a transitional mode of change. And that means that at some stage, the NUG may have to take the lead in moving from a, a resistance uh, action to both a resistance and a transitional. Uh, a mode of action. We can discuss that uh, eventually uh, in our Q&A. Uh, these are just uh, points that need to be brought out uh, quickly. Uh, finally, uh, a concern is that if we are going to also uh, address the narrative struggle, there may need to be a some sort of a uh, recording of what has taken place, an official recording, an official uh, semi uh, official, if you will, uh, uh, documentation of uh, what took place. Uh, that it could be, it could be a white paper issued uh, uh, by the NUG on the background, on the history on the terms uh, uh, that uh, should be understood how to address the, the, the problem. Uh, and, and this is also to avoid uh, speculative analysis uh, as we move forward. Uh, uh, in, in, in the previous period, you hear that uh, the, the uh, CDM movement is, is is uh, designated or, or is uh, named as a as a uh, uh, writing uh, rioters uh, uh, action. Uh, the East, uh, the ethnic armed organizations are see as are depicted as 
rebellions uh, around the country. That is a faulty picture of what is happening. The CDM is a protest movement, is a democracy movement. It is not a group of rioters. Now, that has to be straightened out. That has to be clarified. And, uh, and therefore, uh, there, there is a need uh, to define what took place there uh, so that we can measure the progress as we, as we discuss about this with all due respect to what is happening in Myanmar. Uh, but uh, it, it is very important that uh, we are all clear, we are all clear about what, is, what took place in, in Myanmar. Uh, issues of failed state, I think we should, we should not uh, easily uh, go there. Uh, a, uh, a writing that, uh, that has gone, uh, going, is going around at the moment is a foreign, foreign uh, uh, what is this, the, the magazine, uh, 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 a write-up by uh, Tan Mian Wu, uh, saying that uh, Myanmar is now headed towards a revolution. It's a very interesting article. Uh, th this should be read. Uh, it does clarify the situation in Myanmar. Now, finally, uh, what can the international community do? It can start by imposing, as Omar said, a clear arms embargo, because that is what is going to hit uh, the, uh, the junta directly. Uh, and uh, secondly, uh, to flag uh, companies that continue to do business with the Tatmadaw. And at least we can say at least five countries in the, in the, in the ASEAN area that are doing, still doing business in, in, in Myanmar, uh, including Indonesia, uh, Vietnam, Philippines, Singapore, and, and, and Thailand. Uh, in all areas uh, of, of uh, activities. And, and therefore, uh, this, is, this is imperative also to, to uh, uh, de-operationalize the Tatmadaw in terms of its, its finances. But uh, more to the point, uh, what is within the reach of ASEAN at the moment is gradually to move towards acknowledging the NUG, legitimating the NUG, to create the level playing field for a dialogue to take place eventually when it does take place. And the uh, resolution at the UN is a key element in moving forward on this in, in ASEAN, because that signals that it is not only ASEAN, uh, that is concerned, but also the international community as a whole. Uh, and that will give ASEAN, for whatever it's worth, a bit more uh, push towards uh, trying to uh, secure conditions within Myanmar so that all parties uh, are able uh, to start a process of dialogue towards this final settlement of the issue. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Fama Rizuki Darusman, for your um, for your talk. You've highlighted you've highlighted um, interesting. You're battling narratives in some ways. You're clarifying as regards, for example, CDM is not a group of writers. And uh, at one point, you've also stated that NUG may have to take a lead at one point. That's the national unity government. And um, you've also outlined clearly what needs to be done, like clear arms embargo and flag companies that still um, do business with Myanmar. Um, and I concur with you on that note. We will move on to presentation by um, or talk by Debbie Stoddhart. Um, she's coordinator of the Alternative Asian Network on Burma. Where, whereby in her uh, presentation or her talk, she will discuss ASEAN community in promoting peace and encouraging peace in, in, in Myanmar and also call for the release of political prisoners and foreigners detained in Myanmar. Quite interestingly, she will discuss one aspect that hasn't been discussed by previous speakers, which is the human security aspect. I'm very much looking forward to your talk, um, Debbie, and I'm sure um, the audience as well. Um, participants um, are looking forward um, to your talk. 
before I give the screen and the time to you, I would like to welcome participants. If they have questions that they wish to ask, they can write in the question and answer um, um, column in the below. You see here and you can uh, write your questions there. This is a golden opportunity to actually ask questions for people who know hands-on what's actually happening. Um, thank you, Debbie. The time is yours now. You have 15 minutes. Thank you, Farah. And uh, it's always an honor to be on the same panel with uh, Pat Marzuki and uh, Oma and also a new friend, Wong Pun. And, uh, uh, and also our esteemed keynote speaker, Pat Abdul Kadir. Um, I just wanted to share this data. And if you look at the uh, orange lines, the orange uh, lines uh, mark the number of attacks that targeted or harmed civilians for every year. And you can see from the first year of transition, it was 424 and it went up to 1,024 in the year 2020. Um, at the same time, we looked at the number of incidents that happened between 1st of February when the coup started until the end of April so the yellow uh, uh, line shows that, and we can see already that within the first three months of the coup, the number of attacks that targeted or harmed civilians is more than 150% within three months of the whole year of 2020. So we could already see that uh, uh, the trend in the past few years has been really worrying. Now, uh, the latest figures show that in the first four months of the coup, February, March, April, and May, we already have a total of 2,098 attacks that have targeted or harmed civilians. And between 200,000 and 250,000 people have been displaced, including in the urban centers, in places like Bago, where there was a massacre that killed over 80 people. Um, in uh, in, uh, in, in Karen uh, State, in, sorry, in Kaya State, also known as uh, Kareni State, you can also see near uh, Thailand, um, between 25 to 30% of the population of the entire state has been displaced by conflict in the past few weeks. So you can already see there's going to be a huge human security. This as a, there's already a huge human security problem in the country, but also around the neighboring countries, including Thailand and other ASEAN states where there have been uh, uh, involuntary migration or refugees and asylum seekers from Myanmar. And you can also see with the red dots where the recent attacks have happened. Now, uh, on the 24th of April, we saw uh, the ASEAN meeting taking place in Jakarta between ASEAN leaders and the leader of the Burmese military junta. And one of the key points in the five-point consensus was a de-escalation of violence. If you see the red bar, those are that is the data that we have for the five weeks after the ASEAN meeting, compared with the yellow bar, which is the uh, uh, the situation five weeks before the ASEAN meeting. And if you look before and after, there's actually been a slight increase in the violent incidents targeting civilians including air and drone strike, a grenade attacks, looting of property, shelling and missile attack. The only thing that we have seen is that the number of civilians that were killed were reduced. Um, one of the important things to consider with the air and drone strike is that the ACLED, the source of this information, only counts uh, multiple airstrikes in one place on the one day as one incident. Um, it is, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. 
But what we also have to see is in the month of May, we saw two major offensives. One in Minda in Chin State in the West, where the town of Minda, a small town, was bombarded with artillery and airstrikes. Uh, in order to uh, uh, in order to to suppress and to gain control of this small town, and more than half of the residents are now hiding in the jungle. After that uh, offensive was over in in the west of the country, the military started a new offensive in Kareni or Kaya State, as I mentioned, and. There, in that, in that uh, offensive, schools and churches were bombed. And this is why we say uh, local people are, uh, have estimated that between 25% and 30% of Kaya state population has been displaced. So this is quite a shocking statistic and also really undermines this idea that somehow the military held a coup to stop crumbling democracy. Uh, this is actually a direct attack on democracy. So the pretext or the excuse to justify this coup has been totally destroyed by the actual actions of the military junta. Now, um, earlier I said that uh, the number of airstrikes were counted as one per day in one location. But our team actually went through the data and found that in the one week after the ASEAN meeting, if you count the number of times that the aircraft came to bomb that place, there were actually 68 airstrikes within a week. And very often, the military uses drones in those areas to identify targets. So if civilians are hit, they, we know that they know these are civilian areas. It is not an accident. You can get this uh, fact sheet from our, um, from our website. What we can also see from here, from the data provided by AAPP, the Assistance Association for Political Prisoners in Burma, that a total, as of 16 of June, there were a total of 6,078 confirmed arrests. And from those arrests, 4,911 people are still detained as political prisoners. Nearly 2,000 are evading arrest, and more than 800 people have been confirmed as killed. Pak Marzuki said it's closer to 1,000, and I agree, but uh, the, the AAPP are very strict about verifying their data. Important to note that the, uh, this is the highest number of mass arrests and detentions in 30 years in the country. This is a huge huge problem. Now, when we look at a human security, we also need to recognize that the world and ASEAN is uh, confronted by the threat to human security known as the COVID pandemic. If you look at this data, you will see from Worldometers that there was a very sharp drop in uh, COVID infections in Myanmar after the coup. Thank you, military junta. Somehow, the military junta has miraculously eradicated COVID from Myanmar. Do you believe that? I don't. What has really happened is that the military, which already was undermining the COVID response before the coup, has uh, created a COVID crisis because they have attacked the health infrastructure, they've attacked health workers, and they've actually killed health workers, and they have actually uh, restricted uh, uh, testing of COVID. In some places, um, the hospitals have become military bases. So this is a worrying trend because we actually do not know how many people have been infected by COVID and people uh, and uh, health professionals are concerned that Myanmar, because of the current situation, 
caused by the junta may actually be the source of a COVID variant if we are not careful. So this is quite problematic. Um, if you see on this map on the right of the screen, it's basically, please don't try to read it, it actually appears in one of our briefers, which is available on our website. We, we saw that uh, in 2020, the COVID response was um, really depending on civil society organizations, especially in conflict affected areas and remote areas to help people understand what is COVID and to help them uh, prevent the spread of COVID. Since then, we saw that the military junta after the coup started targeting uh, um, health personnel and even last week hunted down and arrested the former head of COVID response. Uh, and she will be uh, charged with treason which has the maximum death penalty, the maximum penalty of death. And this was because she had expressed concern about the COVID response after the military coup and also because the military was trying to get her to cancel the COVID shield order, the vaccine order from India, so that they could uh, buy Sputnik from Russia instead. So uh, when we look at the uh, public health threats uh, created by the junta, we've seen that um, the military security forces have beaten and killed medical workers, fired their guns on ambulances, uh, fired weapons into hospitals and turned hospitals into army bases. The junta purged government departments, including the, uh, the, the uh, Ministry of Health, and um, stopped and in interfered with the COVID guidance, tracking, vaccinations, testing, etc. In response, you can see that health workers and other civil servants have joined the CDM or the civil disobedience movement, which the junta has the label as a kind of a, a, a terrorist rioters, but the CDM has been nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize this year. Roughly 500,000, nearly half of the Ministry of Health staff have joined uh, the civil disobedience movement. At the same time, nearly three or more than 350 of Myanmar's 1,000 public hospitals have closed and many others do not have enough staff. Millions of people who stayed at home to avoid COVID have been protesting in 95% of the country. And some of the medics who got the first dose of COVID shield vaccine refused to go and get the second dose because they do not want to be arrested or forced to go back to work under the junta. So um, this, has, uh, this has really uh, created a huge, huge problem in the country. We've also seen attack on the economy. Disproportionate use of violence against the CDM and strikers are destroying the economy. The military has massacred factory uh, workers, have uh, gone after crackdown on unions, and more than 600,000 have lost their jobs. More than 100,000 internal migrant workers have fled. One in, in, in Langtaya industrial zone, which is one zone alone, 100,000 workers, factory workers who are internal migrants left. The UNDP says 48% of the population will be in poverty by the end of, by early next year. And local people who tried to donate food to um, others who had lost their jobs were arrested by the junta. What is also worrying is that 80% of all bank branches in the country were shut down for a long time, mainly because of the violence of the military and also the internet restrictions imposed by the junta. So if we see this situation continue, we will, not, we will see the rise of military-owned companies 
that will shut, uh, will, will use military power to force people off their land to grab natural resources. We saw that the junta seems happy to destroy the domestic economy and, and escalate violence to gain control of the country because it expects ASEAN to continue providing political, security, and economic support. So what are, sorry, I know I'm running out of time. What are the solutions? If you look at this table, you will see in red on the left, the ASEAN role, and in blue, the movement priority. You know, movement of the priority of the movement is to de-escalate violence, and that also requires a global arms embargo. So we can already see that ASEAN needs to engage UN Security Council as a partner because the junta does not respect ASEAN. ASEAN needs to have a little bit more power um, and it needs to partner up with the UN Security Council. Um, ASEAN also needs to strengthen its leverage with the junta by supporting an arms embargo so it can actually have something to negotiate with. Um, we can also see that the humanitarian crisis, protection of civilians, the displaced, and non-reform do not force refugees to go back to the, to the situation of conflict. Building community resilience requires ASEAN to support cross-border aid to halt any forced deportations to Myanmar, including countries like Malaysia, allow asylum seekers to access services, as including health, and to ensure that any ASEAN factories or investors will pay wages to the workers in Myanmar who they are employees, even though they are on strike. Um, reducing the, the economic control of the junta is important. Uh, we have to understand that one of the motivations of the coup was fear that the second term NLD government under Aung San Suu Kyi will reduce the power of military owned companies. And it was also about Min Aung Lang, the senior general, wanting to be president. So we can already start to see that targeting economic sanctions to reduce the profit motive of the military can also create cracks in the military. We also think about, we also see that accountability and for crimes and transitional justice for the country is important, which means that ASEAN needs to cooperate with the independent investigative mechanism on Myanmar, the International Criminal Court, the International Court of Justice, and other justice bodies who are looking at the Myanmar situation. And if we want to have genuine legislative reform, a country based on inclusion and diversity, where the Rohingya are included, we need to build peace and, and democracy, then it's very clear that ASEAN needs to engage with the national unity government and other stakeholders, support civil society work and independent media, and also support the protection of Rohingya refugees and the reconciliation processes that have started in response to the coup. In all of this, ASEAN needs to be centering its approach on Myanmar on the ASEAN Charter commitments to democracy, good governance, rule of law, and human rights. Um, I'm um, just in, I'm going to I'm going to stop here to say that. The National Unity Government represents 76% of elected members of parliament. It is the most diverse government in Burma's history, and um, it is working in partnership with ethnic political groups. If we really want to build peace, this is the kind of government we need to support, where ethnic groups are considered as equals to the mainstream Burmans and can run the country together. Thank you. Thank you very much, Debbie, for your, um, 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 I would say, um, analytical presentation, because you mentioned human security. You talk about people who, um, who fled, people who were displaced, and also how this is a threat to regional human security. And you also call for um, a centered engagement on um, ASEAN Charter commitment um, to democracy, good governance, rule of law, and human rights. 
and specifically you point out that what's necessary is a uh, so collaboration or maybe um, like a partnership or maybe uh, a teamwork uh, in some sense between ASEAN and the NUG and also stakeholders in Myanmar. And that's a very good point on uh, human security. And let's hear to uh, let's hear from a resource person or one of our speakers who lives very close to Myanmar. We have with us um, Wong Kun Amarin Tewa, uh, who is with editorial, the one uh, editor who is an editorial staff at the 101 Thailand. He will discuss about economic and democracy quality impact for uh, younger generations, uh, Y and Z, from the current crisis in Myanmar, and whether younger generation in Asia need to engage in a movement in some ways to promote change and what are the ways to engage in such a movement. And um, just to provide a connection or bridging from what you've raised, Debbie, with um, later on what um, Wong Kun will present, what are the existing conditions of Myanmar refugees living on the border? We'll hear, we'll hear firsthand from Wong Kun. Wong Kun, the time is yours. Okay, thank you very much for inviting me here. I'm very honored to be here. Uh, in Thailand, as uh, as Farah mentioned, I'm a journalist uh, focusing on Southeast Asia, and I have been following the situation in Myanmar very closely, and I have made some reports about Myanmar to, to many Thai audiences. You know, um, Thai people have uh, Thai people are really interested in what what is happening in Myanmar so much. It is because of one factor. It is that um, Thai people and Myanmar people both are experiencing the same thing. It is that uh, the strong military intervention in politics. And I need to mention this uh, in the beginning of my pre presentation because I would like to imply that uh, right now it is not only Myanmar, uh, it is not only Myanmar which is uh, encountering the rise of authoritarianism, but also Thailand. And it is not only Myanmar and Thailand which are encountering this kind of situation, but also the rest of Southeast Asian countries. Okay, let, let me share the slides. Okay, so firstly, I would like to I would like to mention this first. I would like all of us to to view the Myanmar group. Like it's not just a national phenomenon of Myanmar itself, right? But actually the Myanmar group is a part of the regional phenomenon. It's only the little picture of the big picture, right? And what is that phenomenon? It is the phenomenon of the rise of authoritarianism, the setback of democracy, and the setback of liberal values throughout the region. And this trend uh, is became obvious since the middle of two, of the 2010s. Now is following the global trend which has seen the strengthening of the right wing in many parts of the world. For example, the rise of Donald Trump in the US and uh, the rise of um, many right wing leaders in some European countries. And Southeast Asia has also followed this trend. So let me show you this. It is the democracy index from economic intelligence unit, right? So what you will see, you will see that uh, almost all Southeast Asian countries are experiencing the decline in the quality of democracy, except Malaysia and Thailand. Uh, it is because uh, Malaysia, like that, there was an election in 2018, and in Thailand there was a general election in 2019. So that, that's why the that's why the uh, the, the score increased. But actually, in the case of Thailand, uh, if we compare the index in of this period of time to the period before before the coup d'etat in 2014, these are lower. Like because uh, be before the 2014, the, the index are between um, 6.3 to 6.8, right? So, so you will see like, Thailand has, has also seen some declining in the trend of democracy, right? And next, I will show you uh, the freedom scores of Southeast Asian countries. So you would also see, right, almost all Southeast Asian countries are experiencing the decline of the freedom, except Malaysia. Mm -hmm. So 
but but I but I guess like Malaysia would see the decline this year because because this was um this was measured before before the implementation of the state of emergency earlier this year. And although there are not these indices, so we can I believe we can see the rise the rising trend of authoritarianism through our eyes. We can witness this, right? In Myanmar, we have uh, Myanmar has a coup earlier this year. In Thailand, uh, we also had a coup in 2014. In Cambodia, around the same time, uh, the Prime Minister Hun Sen consolidated more of his power since 2018. And Philippines, we see the rise of uh, Lodico Duterte, who seems to be inclined to right-wing populism, right? And yeah, almost all of Southeast Asian nations are experiencing this kind of trend now, now today. So I would reiterate once again that uh, the Burmese coup is, is not just a national phenomenon, but it's a part of the regional phenomenon. But nevertheless, the phenomenon of the setback of democracy in Southeast Asia has led to the rise of the other phenomenon as well. And it is the phenomenon of the rise of the political movement and the social movement of the young generation across Southeast Asia. Yeah, and the young generation today, they are Generation Y, Generation C, or the millennials. So what's happening to this generation? Um, this generation are the generations uh, who have grown up uh, with the very, very highly globalizing world. So they grown up with um, very convenient access to the internet, to the social media, right? And they can traveling abroad really conveniently compared to the past. So um, those, made, uh, those has made them like very easily to explore the world. They can explore the world very easily, right? Uh, and they can see the, wide, the world really widely. So that, therefore, most of the young generation these days uh, applies to the sense of um, being a global citizen rather than being a citizen of just one nation, right? And also they have a very strong faith to the values of democracy and liberalism. Right? Because when they explore the world, they can, they can have a look, like they, they can see how the developed countries look like. And they realize that those countries can, can be developed because of one thing, it is good politics, right? They, they learn that um, the quality of politics is highly relevant to every aspect of their lives. Yes, uh, they realize this very well. In Thailand, we have one very popular, uh, uh, very popular hashtag. It is the hashtag called Thakan Mundi in Thai and in English it is if our politics were good. For example, if our politics were good, we could have uh, a good road to drive, we could have a good footpath to walk. If politics were good, we could have a fresh air to breathe. If politics were good, we could have um, enough, enough COVID-19 vaccines today. They related everything to, to politics. Yeah, so they, and, and they believe that uh, everything can be good because of good politics. And in their view, good politics can be brought about only by the system of full-fledged democracy, right? It is the democracy in which the people can have a voice being listened, in which the people can participate actively in politics, in which um, there is a very strong check and balance. And of course, this kind of good politics uh, cannot happen in the regime, which is authoritarianism or, or even the uh, defective democracy. Right, so Southeast Asian young generation uh, realize this very well. So uh, that is why when they when they see the the setback of democracy in their own countries, they come out. They come out to protect the democracy. They come out to protect the liberal values which are being destroyed by the leaders of their own countries. Uh, that is why Myanmar people come uh, come out to. Uh, to launch the CDM movement against the against the coup against the junta, 
because they believe that um, because Myanmar, uh, Myanmar people believe that they cannot have the bright future under the regime which is controlled by the um, by the junta by the military right in Thailand as well last year we we seen the rise of the protest of the young generation right in Philippines in Indonesia as well we see the big protest right. <clears throat> And also the, uh, more interesting than that, we also see um, the youth movement in of East Southeast Asian countries. They're learning the lesson from each other. And also they have some cooperation with, with one another. Right? For example, in Indonesia last year, they, uh, they looked to Thailand as a model. In Myanmar also, uh, Myanmar and Thailand, uh, the, the youth movements in Myanmar and Thailand has some exchange. Like they, they exchange some tactics, they exchange some, um, they exchange some, some displays of the distant, right? And also, uh, that there are the cooperation in 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 the campaign of multi alliance, right? They they support one another. Like for example, when I, uh, sometimes I went to the 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 protests of the Myanmar people, uh, in in Bangkok to protest against the coup. Uh, over there, there, there were not only the Myanmar people, but there were also a number of Thai people joining force with Myanmar people. So we see this kind of, of cooperation, right? And also, um, the movement in one country can, can, can inspire the movement in other countries, right? For, for example, um, in, in Laos, in Laos, for example, uh, in Laos, although there, there, there were not the, the big, the big movement, there were not the big protests, but at least, um, Laos people, uh, after they, after they, they, they witnessed the protest in Thailand, they began questioning the politics of their own country. So, uh, that there are some days that, uh, the hashtag of, uh, Tha Can Mung Lao Di, or if Laos politics were good, trending on Twitter in Laos. Like, so at, at least, like, uh, it can help inspire the movement of other countries. Yeah, and also we, we see the, um, the the young generation of, of East Southeast Asian countries help disseminating the fact of what is happening in other countries through the world to let the world know, right? Thai people share what is happening to the Philippines, what's happening to Indonesia, what's happening to, to Myanmar on their social media platform to, to let the world know, right? So we will see this kind of cooperation between the youth movements. And this is, this is really good. Yes. But, um, on the other hand, we must, we must not forget that, uh, meanwhile, the pro democratic youth in Southeast Asia are cooperating and learning from one another. The authoritarian in Southeast Asia, the authoritarian, uh, sorry, the authoritarian leaders in Southeast Asia are doing the same. <laughs> so I mean, like, like this, um, they, they, they look to one another as the model. Like, for example, the Myanmar military follow, uh, follow the, the Thai military model to take over the power of people. This is the example. Like they, they learn from one another very well. Mm -hmm. And also, like they, they have, they also have some cooperation. Like in these few years, you know, um, Southeast Asia leaders has have some cooperation in, uh, like they they helping one another in silencing and suppressing the dissidents. Like for example, um, the the Thai activists were killed or forced disappearance in Laos and Cambodia. Uh, the Vietnamese blockers were um, were sent, were sent, um, were kidnapped in Bangkok and sent back to Vietnam from Thailand. These are, these are the examples of the cooperation between the authoritarian leaders in Southeast Asia. Right? So they, they, um, the leaders in Southeast Asia, in Southeast Asia, they have a very high mutual benefit. So that, that's why they, they, they like to cooperate with one another. And thereby, it is not surprising to me that Southeast Asian countries and ASEAN are, are pretty reluctant to, uh, to put pressures on the top level. Right. And that's why the people lose faith in ASEAN really, really much. 
and as I and and as I have mentioned before, that um, Southeast Asian leaders are learning and looking to one another as a model. So therefore, um, I would mention that uh, supposing the Taj Mahal can successfully control over Myanmar in the end, this would of course motivate other Southeast Asian leaders to enhance more of their powers. Right? They they would they would look. At, at the Myanmar military as a model of how to how to take over the power from the civilians legitimately without repealing any constitution. Um, and also like they would have a look at the Tatmadaw model, how they suppress the civilian movement. So I mean like if the Tatmadaw can win at the end, it would um, it would lead the rest of Southeast Asian countries to move more, to move into incline further to authoritarianism, right? But on the other hand, if the result turn opposite, like I, I mean, if the Burmese people can successfully overthrow the military, the whole Southeast Asia can turn in the opposite way, right? Because the, the triumph of the Burmese people will encourage the, the, the democratic movement across Southeast Asia Right to, uh, to become more active, right, and this this will this will cause the democracy to gain momentum in the region, and this would cause uh, the Southeast Asian leaders uh, who who are authoritarian to to lose momentum in the end. Uh, Wong Hun, um, yes. your time is up. Apologies. Sorry. Your time is up. Apologies. Oh, okay, okay. So I we will wrap it up. Right. Okay, so uh, I, I mentioned all of this because um, so this is the reason why the young generation in Southeast Asia need to um, cooperate with one another. And right now they, they need to they need to support the Myanmar movement. Right? Because um, because the if the Myanmar if the Myanmar people can triumph over the over the military, so it, it also means the right is also mean that democracy can uh, can gain momentum in the region. So, uh, supporting the Myanmar movement is equivalent to supporting the democracy in in your own countries. Right? So that's why I encourage the young generation in across Southeast Asia to support Burma people in the way in the way you can do. For example, you can use the social media as a tool, right? To um, to to help encourage the international community to help encourage the ASEAN to do more, to help to help the civilian movement, and also you can use the social social media as a tool to uh, support to sharing up one another, to share sharing up um the Myanmar movement. Thank you. Right. For example, yeah. So this end of my round. Thank you. Thank you so much, Wong Kun, for your um um thorough talk with visualizations you've mentioned about the rise of um, age, Southeast Asia youth movement as well as also unfortunately for those who are from ASEAN or um, um, ASEAN communities there was, there was also a rise of authoritarianism I'm reminded of a, of a book written by, um, by um, a scholar um, I can't get her name out now but she she wrote, she wrote about um, the origins of totalitarianism and it, it bears a resemblance of what you um, what you presented. Now we are opening question and answer session and we have questions already. And I would like to invite all speakers to um, activate their um, camera so we can see you. Uh, okay, first question we have around, thank you, Pak Marzuki, that is fine. Um, um, I'm going to um, take my um, prerogative as a moderator and uh, select a few questions that are directly relevant to um, presentations already given and talks already given. First, um, I think um, um, it's a question. I'm going to um, merge these two questions. Um, what or which Asian country or Western country do you see providing the most potential assistance um, as regards um, the coup to the end of the coup? and ending the coup? And what assistance would that be? And second, um, how, um, what role um, does the common or general public in ASEAN um, country members, including Indonesia, have played in encouraging peace and democratization in Myanmar? So those two questions, I would like to uh, um, um, ask uh, each 
resource person, each speaker to respond within one minute. So uh, please be brief and also be liquid um, in your answer. Um, I welcome the first one. If, um, if Kin Umar is back, is she back? Um, Kin? If not, then we can uh, proceed with uh, Pak Marzuki and Wong Kun and Devi. I welcome Pak Marzuki first. Uh, okay, Farah. The question was, uh, which country is it? Uh, um, it? Which Asian country or Western country would do you see providing the most potential assistance uh, to the end of the coup? In ending the coup, I think what uh, this person means, and what assistance would there be? And also, um, um, what have we played in ASEAN in encouraging peace and democratization in Myanmar um, as regards um, the coup? Uh, this well, is overall question is about democracy in an external party. Yes, uh, you see, I, I, I'm quite uh, attracted to the uh, analysis of by Wong, uh, Wong Kun, uh, that for Indonesia, it's, it's a make or break because we, uh, the Indonesians look at themselves as the most democratic uh, country at the moment. And what is happening in Thailand in, in uh, uh, Myanmar uh, is that uh, it, it is a direct uh, assault on, on democracy in ASEAN. Now, uh, ASEAN cannot move because there are so many, there are a few ASEAN uh, uh, member states that, are, for lack of a, a definition, Myanmar look alike. I, I, I will not uh, mention uh, specific uh, countries, but I think uh, Wong has uh, uh, laid it out quite clearly. And therefore, uh, ASEAN cannot do much at the moment. Uh, uh, in terms of uh, pushing the five-point uh, 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 consensus immediately, uh, what needs to happen is that ASEAN needs to be uh, pushed to a position where it has to uh, acknowledge the NUG. And, and therefore, uh, uh, that is the priority at the moment. I notice that uh, there are questions about uh, the regional uh, comprehensive economic uh, uh, what is this, uh, partnership. That is precisely the, the issue. Uh, I think the NUG should claim that it is the legitimate governing uh, entity in, in Myanmar. So that ASEAN will have to decide on this because uh, the junta doesn't care about what is happening in the UN. It does very much care that ASEAN is sympathetic to its position and that it has, uh, as uh, Debbie was saying, uh, ready to support the, uh, the junta. But uh, if ASEAN uh, recognizes, uh, acknowledges the, also the existence of NUG, it will, it will certainly affect the way the junta is going to behave inside the country because it cannot rely automatically on ASEAN backing because uh, the, the uh, NUG is also acknowledged as a legitimate party to a dialogue. And so uh, Indonesia, I think, uh, could take the lead on this together with Thailand. Indonesia being the uh, largest country uh, and Thailand being the, uh, the what is this, the uh, uh, front line uh, co country uh, with, with Myanmar. Thank you, and so, Yeah, so that, that would be my uh, take. Thank you, Pam Marzuki um, We'll move on to Debbie. We would love to hear your, um, your take on the, um, from a human security perspective on these two questions. I think, uh, actually, I typed about five answers in the Q&A boxes. I have answered five questions already. But I think, uh, firstly, what has been very inspiring is that the Milti Alliance in Indonesia has been very active. 
um, and uh, and also uh, there's been a huge amount of interest, especially with Hukum Online and other uh, organizations having uh, webinars and discussions. I think it's quite important that uh, as uh, Indonesia does need to take the lead, as Pat Marzuki has said, and actually Pat Marzuki is a very good example. He's one of the leading Indonesian voices standing on this uh, in in support and and working very hard in support of the pro democracy movement in in Myanmar. So I think we we do need to start uh, emulating Pat Marzuki. I hope there will be more Indonesians like Pat Marzuki Okay, actively uh, working, but also, you know, engaging in cross-border humanitarian aid because uh, the economic sanctions will not hurt the people. The people are already hurt by the military. In fact, the people in the country are demanding economic sanctions because they know very well that this junta is going to be grabbing all the financial, has already started grabbing all the financial resources. So we need to help the movement by Indonesia, you know, working with ASEAN and with Thailand to organize cross-border assistance along the Thai border. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie, um, for your for your answer. Um, Wong Kun, um, we would love to hear your views on this. Okay, so uh, in in my view, like I, I can I cannot start with um this this country do better than this country in in terms of helping Myanmar, right? But um because I I believe um is is of the countries uh, are do uh, like they, they are doing in their own ways right but i believe like the organization the organization which can uh, which is the most possible to to help finding the solutions to the pinma problem i i still believe it is asean maybe because you know um uh, com compared to the other international organization i think i believe that um the tatmadaw the tatmadaw trust more on ASEAN compared to the other organizations, you know, because um, if, if we look at the past, for example, uh, at the incident of the cyclone Nakis, right? Uh, when when the uh, when when the UN when the other organizations try to reach out to 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 providing help to Myanmar to Myanmar, uh, at that time the Myanmar military, uh, like they they did not want to to accept the help maybe because they have no we have they have some some kind of the the untrust in in those organizations right but uh, but when ASEAN tech uh, took an action um Myanmar began to open right Myanmar began to allow the began to allow ASEAN began to allow other countries to allow uh, other international organizations to to reach out to to providing help right this is the example so so I still believe I still believe that uh, it is uh, because the Tatmadaw, the Myanmar military, uh, still have very good connections with the leaders in Southeast Asia, right? So, um, so I still believe that ASEAN can can help can help the most in in Myanmar situation. But anyway, uh, you know, because the um, I, I think. But but I think that the ASEAN way have have some some de de some defection some defective, right? In 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 this like for example the the principle of the of not intervention for example so it I think maybe the ASEAN had need to revise need to revise how how they could reach out to Myanmar to engage to help finding solutions to to end the conflict. Thank you. Um, thank you, Wong Kun, for your for your um, for your answer. And it, it call, um, he calls us to really reflect on the principle of non-interference, which um, is one of the questions that was raised. Unfortunately, we are running out of time. Um, I would like to <laughs> to uh, provide a summary, if I may. Um, um, and if you before that, if you have questions, uh, King uh, Omar can I join us for the question and answer session because he. She has a, a session at the European uh, Parliamentary. Um, Debbie just messaged us, let's have another webinar. Um, I welcome that idea. Um, so if you have questions, uh, specific questions of what's happening in Myanmar, feel free to um, email um, uh, the organizer. Uh, or if your questions haven't been addressed, uh, uh, forward your questions to, um, to the organizer and we'll, uh, we'll pass on these questions for answer to um, um, the speakers who are here with us. And if I may wrap up, 
uh, after I wrap up, I will give time for each speaker to provide a closing statement. And I hope they will um, talk a little bit about democracy in Myanmar and how to assess that because there's a question about that. So we have heard from the very beginning, the current situation in Myanmar, a sort of an emic perspective from within what's happening in Myanmar from Kin Omar. And she described the skepticism. Uh, um, she phrased it very um, eloquently, um, cautious optimism. Um, and she also said that democracy is a process. And um, Pak Marzuki Darusman, um, um, he pointed out um, that uh, it, there's nothing wrong with pursuing a two-level track, an ASEAN-level track, and also the individual countries also pursuing, um, each of them pursuing different measures and diplomacy track. And also the important point that he also raised, Pak Marzuki raised, is um, how we should combat and battle narratives that are not correct, what's happening, of what's happening in Myanmar. We have a... Um, a very um, an epic human security point of view uh, provided with uh, statistics and data by Debbie. And uh, we can actually um, see that there are still civilians being killed in, in, in Myanmar despite or in spite of maybe uh, the ASEAN consensus. And Wong Poon, you've highlighted um, that um, ASEAN news, we talk to each other, that we look at each other. We're not strange bad fellows. So it is a relief that although the, I speak a different language from maybe Debbie or you, uh, but I speak a similar language like Mar by Marzuki. Um, but we look upon each other. However, there's a worrisome trend whereby there's a rising um, authoritarianism trend in Southeast Asia. So there should be probably a conversation between generation. I'm going to stop here and give each of you a time for um, a closing statement, please. Uh, maybe Debbie, you can start. You know, I'm wearing a batik shirt. And do you know where I got this batik from? Malaysia? From Myanmar. Oh, Myanmar, okay. <laughs> so this is Indonesian batik, which is very valued and appreciated traditionally in Myanmar. The link between Indonesia and, and Burma or Myanmar it goes back to the time when Myanmar was the one of the first ASEAN uh, Southeast Asian countries to recognize Indonesian independence. And uh, unfortunately, the military drafted a constitution based on Indonesia's discarded uh, constitution that gave the military uh, uh, political power. So we can see um, we are all much closer than we think. Actually, in many respects, we are much closer than our governments. So we need to keep the communication, the information and the solidarity going so that eventually our governments will have to listen to us because they have no other choice. Thank you. Thank you, Devi. Pa Marzuki, uh, the time is yours for a closing statement. Uh, nothing much to add, uh, actually, uh, than what Debbie has uh, said, and uh, I agree with with uh, Wong that uh, the uh, regional situation has, in a way, also uh, allowed uh, what has taken place uh, in Myanmar to take place. Uh, I thank Debbie for the very graphic uh, rendering of the situation, uh, giving out this, this really the urgency of taking action. But unfortunately, uh, this will have to continue for uh, a while. It, things cannot get better before it gets uh, worse, I suppose. That, that is, the, 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 what is this? The, the reality of the situation. No, no point in glossing over that, but then uh, I think uh, we need to spotlight uh, actively uh, Indonesia <laughs> and Thailand, yeah, uh, because uh, these are the two countries that that uh, have either a concern uh, because of its internal uh, democracy, uh, which is which is uh, at risk being overwhelmed if we had all these illiberal states surrounding Indonesia, and so Indonesia has a has a direct interest in securing democracy in, Thai, in uh, Myanmar. And Thailand, of course, uh, uh, is, is uh, more or less in the same situation. And therefore, uh, it, it should be uh, a conduit to uh, communicate with Junta that, that the sooner this settles, uh, better, uh, that uh, in the, it's in their own interest to, to secure 
that they are perhaps now this is very sensitive that they are not the problem but also part of the solution i yes, i i agree i take caution in in uh, saying this because i don't <laughs> want to demean and to denigrate the courage and the sacrifice of the myanmar people yes i agree we should be part of the um, solution not part of the problem one point would love to hear your closing statement Okay, so I, I would reiterate again that um, the Myanmar crisis is now determining the, determining the fate of the Southeast Asian democracies, right? So uh, I encourage all the young generation in this region. So you must not fight only for democracy for your own countries, but you must also support one another. And right now, because uh, our fellows in Myanmar are like they are in the front line of this battle, so we we must help them. We must support them. And if If they, if the Myanmar people can can win, so it means democracy of the region can win. It can bring about democracy in your countries as well, right? And also, uh, apart apart from apart from being interest, apart from uh, take, putting your interest in the movement of Myanmar people, I would like all of you to also um, keep your eyes on the issue about refugees, right? Because uh, right, right now along the border of Thailand, we we have. Uh, thousands of refugees uh, fled from the, the clashes between the Tatmadaw and the ethnic armed groups. Right, so they are in the very dire situation now, and and so uh, this is uh, this are two two issues that I would like all of us to to keep your eyes on very closely. Uh, the movement of the Myanmar people and also the refugee uh, the refugees issue along the border of Thailand. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wong Pun, uh, Debbie. And Pak Marzuki Darusman, um, I would like to give the uh, the time now to the MC. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Miss Farah. That was an impressive discussion, and I would like to say thank you so much to all the speakers, the moderator, and also the participants for today's, which already attending the Hukum Online International Webinar, encouraging Asian community to promote peace in Myanmar. Hopefully, uh, this discussion can turn a better peace in Myanmar. I hope uh, you get a lot of insights uh, through this webinar. Which uh, we also apologize if there are any shortcomings throughout the event. Finally, I call the show. Excuse myself. See you on the next event. Thank you and good afternoon. Thank you, Thank Debbie. You. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye bye. Bye. Terima kasih to the translators. The recording has stopped.